Today's guest is the editor-in-chief of The Impact Magazine. She's an event producer, life coach, speaker, and Citibank 2021 woman to watch. A memoir, no designation, was launched in January 2022. Welcome to the show, Tanisha. How are you doing? I'm really great. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode of America Podcast. Thanks for your patience too, you know, while setting up all of this with, you know, everything. I'm, 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 <laughs> no worries. I'm, I'm really, I'm really, really, really um, inspired by your story, fascinated by everything that you've gone through up to, up to this moment and, you know, you coming out to becoming who you are today. That's really motivating. And I really, really love, you know, the listeners out there to, to also learn from your life journey so far. And I'm, I'm so happy. I'm so happy that you, you know, you put all of this in your memo already, um, no designation. And I would just love you to, you know, share a bit about this with us, you know, eating rock bottom in 20, um, in 2003, overcoming mental and emotional abuse, homelessness, and finding out who your father was during an episode of Recky Lake. Um, can you share all of this story with us and the inspiration behind, you know, taking us on this journey in your memo also? Sure. Um, no designation, like you said, is about my journey up until, you know, today, right? And so throughout the journey, just been some crazy, you know, crazy things happening uh, to yeah. me um, as I journeyed into adulthood. Mm -hmm. um, just learning, like you said, about my father during an episode of Ricky Lake. And, you know, I know that was pretty hard for my mom. I know um, it was just something that, like she told me, she thought was right. So mm -hmm. my mom comes from like back in the day, you know, back in the 40s, 50s, she, you know, a time where she was married, all of her kids, you know, she wanted to have all of them to have the same father, mm -hmm. you know, and um, her and my dad separated. And during that time that they separated, she met my father. And so she met him, got pregnant, and then her and my stepfather rekindled everything and they had gotten back together for, I think about uh, three years after I was born. And so my mom, you know, was just like, you all are going to have the same father. Mm -hmm. And so my biological father um, told me that he actually um, came to where my mom, you know, my mom and stepdad's house looking for me. And um, my aunt and my grandmother told him, you know, just go about your business. She's going to be fine. We're going to take care of her you know, don't worry about it. Don't start any trouble. So my dad just, you know, went about his business and, you know, kept on moving. Mm. And so then I guess it was, uh, you know, all those years later, my mom decided that it was time for me to know who my biological father was. Now, it wasn't like my stepfather made me feel like, I was not his daughter or, or the family, maybe I had no clue. Um, outwardly, inwardly, I knew inwardly, I knew because as a child, I was just looking like just some of the things and how I felt. And I overheard my mom have a conversation to uh, one of the guys that I looked up to as a brother, his name is Bo, he passed away. And um, I heard her say that uh, some people were questioning if I was my father's child. And so I was like, and I was in middle school. I think, I, no, 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 I was in elementary school and she didn't know I had a half a day. So I was in sixth grade and I came home and I was upstairs and she had no clue. And um, I heard that conversation. And so it clicked to me why I always felt different, even though they didn't make me feel different. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I Outwardly, understand. they didn't, you know, my father didn't, you know, <laughs> he didn't make me feel like I wasn't his child, even yeah. though he knew, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So my mom and I, you know, I was at her house and we were sitting down talking and Ricky Lake pops up 
And so it was after um, the news. My mom is an avid news watcher. So the news, um, 12 o'clock news went off and her stories went off. And so we're watching Ricky Lake pops on and um, we're watching it. And the story is about the theme is these mothers are telling their kids who their fathers are, yeah. you know, yeah. and the kids are like between the ages of five and 10. Mm -hmm. And so as the show is going on, it goes to commercial. And my mom looks at me and says, how would you feel if something like that happened to you? And I was like, uh, she said, because they're so young. And I was like, man, please, I'm, I'm just, you know, I have no clue. I'm yeah. thinking she just starting up a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, the type of father I had, I, man, please, I would love for somebody else to have come and took care of me because even though my father was around he didn't take care of us uh financially and things like that but my mom never talked bad about him and my mom allowed us to be around him on holidays whenever he decided that was gonna go down mm -hmm. but you know I was like man please if somebody else wanted to be my dad and come around and you know, take care of me in the yeah. ways that I need it. I'm good with that. I would be fine. And so I end up, you know, I'm looking back at the TV and she said, well, your father name is William James and he lives in Newark and he works in train. Like just oh. started. <laughs> <laughs> and I oh, was man. like, what? Like, yeah. I couldn't believe my mom, you know, was doing this. And that's how she told me. Hmm. And from there, from that moment, I'm that same day, I met my father. But from that moment, all of my childhood things that I went through far as like my sisters being on drugs and, and my mom keeping my nieces and nephews and everything, you know, hardship that we went through. Um, as children and my mom trying to survive to raise us mm. all of that rage came through me so upset with my mother yeah. and that you know I, I talk about in the book that took me on what I call the spiraling staircase throughout life mm -hmm. you know um, yes. going and allowing those emotions when things pop up mm -hmm. from the emotion from my childhood and the disappointments throughout my life, you know, things that popped up, that rage would come from that. And so that journey has been something else for her. <laughs> oh, uh, that's, that's been a, a long journey. And um, I mean, not a very pleasant journey, but you came out very strong. Like now you are on top of your game, you know, achieving greatness for yourself, fulfilling your purpose also. That's so inspiring for people out there who are, you know, homeless right now, people that are going through such um, right. case. Yeah. But how was it like for you when your mom, when your mother, you know, revealed all of that to you at that moment? How was that for you? It was unbelievable. You know, I didn't know what to feel. I didn't know what to say. And I just looked at her like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my God. Like, but when it, it was the moment that I saw my father that I became complete and whole. Because mm -hmm. even though it wasn't talked about in my family and most of everybody knew except me and my siblings, mm -hmm. um, I didn't feel the connection because I didn't see anyone who looked like me. My mom, of course, everybody's like, oh, you look just like your mom because you don't know who my father is. So I, <laughs> of course I look just like my mom. Yeah. But when I saw my father, I felt the completeness because I looked like him. Yeah. So when I saw him, I was like, oh my God, you know, felt whole, felt complete and understood that this is, this is where the connection is, you know, yeah. this is um, where um, your journey will begin to true wholeness because mm. you now you're complete because yeah. you see yourself. Mm. Yeah, that, that's that's so wonderful. And you know what what inspired you to you know title your memoir No Designation? What was the inspiration behind that? Oh, so wow! So <laughs> mm. No Designation comes from 
Um, so after learning about my father and everything, going through that journey, um, I left my mom's house and I left my mom's house. Well, no, no, no. Yeah. I left my mom's house. I was, I lived on my own in my own apartment, but then I left the city of Trenton where I'm from Trenton, New Jersey. And I just went on this road rage. Like I didn't want anything to do with my family or my mom. I just went through this process of redemption, um, not redemption, rebellion. Mm -hmm. Um, I went on the process of rebellion and just was in the street. And so during that time, um, I went to live with my cousin in North Jersey and, um, met my son's father, you know, got pregnant, had my, uh, son and, you know, it was through that process I had, once I had my son, I had gotten sick. They discovered that I had thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I had to move back home and who was there for me, my mom. (laughs) So I moved back home to my mom's house Mm -hmm. and um, getting there, my mom said to me, you know, you're not working anymore. You're going to have to um, have insurance having this baby. So you need to go down to welfare and um, sign up for that and also um, get Medicaid. And I was like, okay, I didn't know any ins and outs because at that point I didn't need, you know, I was working and everything. So I go down to a welfare and I get my ID. And so um, I have thyroid cancer and everything and I'm going through the motions and then I get into remission. I have the radiation that they give you for that. It's been in my um, system for a year, moved out of my mom's house. And as I was putting up my stuff into my new home, my wallet fell down. Mm -hmm. And so when the wallet falls down, I pick it up and I pick up my contents and in the contents was my welfare ID. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at the welfare ID and I'm just looking it over because that's what we do. You know, I'm just looking it over and on there, it says no designation. And I was like, it says authorized representative. And then it said no designation. And so I'm like, all I paid attention to was no designation because it was in capital letters, um, you know, and it just jumped out at me. And Mm -hmm. I was like, it just hit me like, these people don't think I'm going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. They think I am going to be on welfare for the rest of my life. And that's just not going down with me. And I said, um, I'm only on this because I'm sick and I needed it. And this is what it's supposed to do for you. Right. Yeah. And so I said, you know what? That's OK. I'm going to prove them wrong. Mm-hmm. So that was over 20 years ago. I kept the ID. 2018. Um, I was like, I had already let me back up. I had already began the journey of writing my story. Mm-hmm. But when I wrote it. Um, it was from a position of rebellion and hate and shame, right? And so I completed the whole entire memoir. This is when my son was a baby. So this is about 20 years ago. And I completed it and my aunt died. I had to go to North Carolina. And when I came back home, I tried to get into my computer, but I had a password protected the, the document. And I couldn't get into it. So I took that as I was not supposed to release it at that time because it had so much hate in it. And so it did, it wouldn't have helped anybody. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I had to release that hate. Right. Mm. Yes. And so 2018, I'm, I'm home. I done built up Impact Magazine. I'm doing well. I created a branding company, you know, that helped, uh, um, Uh, companies and some of the names that you might know that, you know, they're millionaires now and I help these companies. And then I'm looking and I just felt the same way as I did in 2003 when I had um, found the ID. I was like, I was in this crossroad kind of space. Right. And so here I am again, cleaning out my pocketbook. I'm going through this space of, I just helped all these people 
get to a certain level in their life, millionaires, new job titles. Um, you know, I had an excellent year with my Women of Impact dinners that was in all kinds of media on Bravo in, in Essence and all of these things. And at the end of the year, looking financially, I'm like, my son is graduating from school. I couldn't even buy him a car if I wanted to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because I sacrificed and used a lot of my money to help some of these brands yeah. and people to do and look great. You know what I mean? Yes, and yes. so then I felt that no designation, right? But let me tell you something. I'm going through my pocketbook and um, I'm just looking through everything. And here comes my same wallet that I had back in 2003 with my ID in it. Mm -hmm. And I saw it. And that moment I said, you know what? Um, it just gave me that same vigor it did back in 2003. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? From this moment on, I'm going to take some time for myself I am going to do what is necessary for me. I'm going to put me first and I have to release, you know, some of these things that's been holding me down and why I'm moving the way it, it like really explains to me why I was moving the way that I was moving, putting myself on a back burner and everyone else ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And so then when I saw that ID, I was like, you know what? I'm going to start writing my story because every time I go to do an event or everything, every, uh, some of the guests will be like, I would really love to hear your story, how you got started and yeah. all those things. And I say, you know what? I'm going to name it no designation, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm going to use my welfare ID as the cover of the book. And then on the back of the book, I'm going to show who I am right now. Yeah. And that, you know, temporary defeat is not permanent failure you know yes i love that defeat defeat is not permanent failure i love that statement yes. right yeah. right right and also also that you used like you said already the id your way for id as a front cover when i first saw the book i was like okay this is so interesting the design the later i go to understand like, oh this is an id it is an id card actually yes 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 yes, yes. yes. and at that time i was sick mm -hmm. and um with thyroid cancer and I, at that time, uh, that day was, I'll never forget it. When I was um, diagnosed with the thyroid cancer and my mom told me to go to welfare, I had gotten amazing, who is my friend to this day, an amazing, um, uh, what, are, what are they called? The agent that comes to you that get, helps you, the social worker yeah. that comes to help you. Mm -hmm. And so they assigned me to a young man named Donnie Walker. We are from the same hometown. I didn't even know who he was. And I find myself here with him. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me because I'm frail, but my clothes are so big because I didn't believe, I didn't want people to see me sick. So I would wear clothes. I looked like I was homeless, you know, yeah. I didn't have any hair. So I wore my head wrapped up and he said, tell me your story. Like what is going on with you? And so I sat down, let him know, you know, I have thyroid cancer and everything. And so he said, I want to help you. He said, but I'm going to expedite this case because I told him, I said, I need a place of my own. Um, you know, my son is here and I know that it is my environment that is making me um, become sicker because you're with a thyroid disease, you know, your environment plays a lot to, with you along with stress, you know? Yeah. And even though my mom let me come stay with her, you know, I had two sisters who were on drugs at the time, you know, they were in and out of her house. It was just, a, a situation where, cause my mom is like, she's not going to leave and abandon her children. She's going to be there and, and help and do what she can. And that's where I got that from, you know, mm -hmm. put herself on the back burner for yeah. others to be okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I'm with him and he said, okay, for us to expedite this and for us to get these things together, you're going to, you're going to have to be available for me to get, paperwork or anything I need. And he said, here's the bus card. And I said, every day I'm going to come to this welfare office and sit. Mm -hmm. 
And if you need me, you just come down, call downstairs and tell me what you need. And I'll, I'll provide it to them. Yeah. Some for a whole like month straight, I was there every day when it opened to it closed. Mm. Some days he called to tell me that he needed some things and some days he didn't, you know, yeah. but I sat down there every day for that 30 day period. And right before the end of the 30 days, um, I had asked my mom to come down there because I wasn't feeling too well. Mm. And so we get down. She said, OK, we get down there. And we're sitting and they call me up and tell me that everything has been done and expedited with my case and that I need to take my ID. Mm -hmm. And so when I get up there to take the ID, the lady's like, oh, you can't have that um, scarf on your head. Yeah. And I almost fell out mm -hmm. because I didn't have any hair, yeah. you know, and um, I, my legs had gotten weak. And so my mom ran over and was like, what's the problem? What's the problem? And I told him, I said, they want me to take off this thing, you know, and she's like, oh my God, you don't have any hair. So she spoke, I had to go sit down because mm -hmm. she helped me go sit down because I was weak at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so my mom went over to the lady and said, you know, my daughter doesn't have any hair. She has thyroid cancer. And so as my mom talking to her, the lady is looking through the paperwork. And she said, well, I don't see the paperwork here. She said, my daughter is very prideful. She probably didn't even give him the paperwork, but her caseworker knows this is why they expedited her case. Mm -hmm. And so he went, he already had the, the medical stuff with him. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he didn't share it because I, I was saying I didn't want people to know or feel bad for me or anything, mm -hmm. but he shared it with them downstairs so that I could take the, the, um, the picture for the ID with my scarf on and that's where that came from and yeah. it's so like I just love the journey right yeah. I love the journey and how the intricate details um just coincide with each other yeah. from that point to the next point to the next point to the next point you know yeah. and at the end of the day the common denominator was my mom was there for me because mm -hmm. a lot of the times even though what she thought she did was right it was right for her yeah you know, it wasn't necessarily right for me as a child. It wasn't necessarily right for me, you know, as going through life, mm -hmm. you know, but she thought she was right. Mm -hmm. And so we always had this connection where, you know, even at that point, I was in rage, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. but I knew that I could count on her for anything. Yeah. Wow. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that. I really enjoy, you know, listening to your, your life journey so far, going through all of that hardship and, you know, you coming out to be someone who has the de designation finally. <laughs> like, yeah, so from going from welfare to becoming the CEO, editor in, um, in chief, the, you know, um, the founder of, um, of Impact Magazine, for example, being a life coach, also a speaker right. and, you know, meeting with the great and wonderful big names out there, helping people with their businesses. That's so wonderful. And I'm sure there are listeners out there who have listened to your life journey so far now and like, yeah, my case, um, it's not as, it's not it's not as bad as yours as Tunisia's <laughs> case uh, that means i have hope of a brighter future I've right hope of a right future. right yeah exactly exactly yeah. and a lot of times um we find that i found not we i found that a lot of our journey and issues stem from our childhood traumas you mm. know what i mean and mm. we make decisions from those traumas mm. let me give you an example I had a good friend of mine come to Utah for some business. And so we're in my house about to have breakfast and we're just talking. And before he came here, he asked me how cold it was. And I said, it's not really that cold. We from Jersey. I'm like, this right here, it's not really that cold. Put yeah. a sweatshirt on, sweat hoodie, you're going to be good. Mm. And so he said, okay. But then while we were at breakfast and that day, I think it was like 65 degrees. And he said, oh my gosh, I can't believe I brought this big coat um, and I didn't even need it. And I looked at him, I said, I told you behind this leaving home, you know, <laughs> I told you it wasn't that cold here. Yes. And he said, oh, Tanisha, man, when I grew up, 
I was so cold. We ain't had heat like for a while. And, you know, I've always had that, you know, stigma of when it's cold outside, I just don't want to be cold. And I looked at him and I said, this is exactly what I'm talking about in my book. Mm-hmm. You made an adult decision off of a childhood trauma. Yeah. Even though I had already told you it wasn't that cold here. You made the decision to bring that coat because you remembered back from your childhood that you were cold and you didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So I told him, you have to accept that you were cold as a child. You know, you have to accept it Mm -hmm. and let it go. And Mm -hmm. that does not mean right now, if you feel a little breeze or anything and you still find yourself cold, that does not mean you failed at anything. That does not mean that you're reliving this trauma. Mm -hmm. So you have to let it go. And now you're carrying around this big coat (laughs) that you don't even need. And that's us as adults when we make decisions from our childhood traumas Mm -hmm. is we're carrying around so much stuff on us that we don't even need. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know, is it ever possible for us to forget this childhood trauma or to forget our emotional and mental abuses of the past? Is, is that ever possible? I, I just for me, it's like I wouldn't say um, to it, it leaves you, mm. but acceptance, accepting what you cannot change, mm. that is the thing that helps you move throughout the day with the trauma. Yeah. That is what makes you go through the day and not make those decisions out of the trauma because you accept it, Yeah, you know, yeah. and that acceptance bring you that inner peace because it had nothing to do with me. Mm. Him not having heat had nothing to do with him. Mm. You know, that yeah. was a survival thing. His mom is trying to survive, yeah. you know. And just like my mom, she did what she thought was best for her, you know? Mm -hmm. So it had nothing to do with me, but we latch on and hold on because the trauma was happening to us and not because not, we didn't cause it, you know? And so once I accepted everything and guess how I was able to accept it, my son, Throughout, you know, the journey of building Impact Magazine, my brand and company and all these things, I did some major sacrificing. We was homeless. You know, we we stayed with my one of my friends that had to stay with one of my, you know, two of my sisters Mm -hmm. and then making the decision to build this thing because I just knew it was going to work. I just knew it that God told me, showed me that it was going to make room for me. And I just, that was just it. I just knew it just had to work. But in those workings of building a life, which a gift, you are always going to go through sacrifices. You're always going to go through some kind of trial in order to get to the triumph and to the goal. Yes. And so during that time, you know, my son, he can't, I used to work for Merrill Lynch in the executive office, making great money, uh, nice house, nice car, everything, you know, great, you know, living for my son. And I was a single mom doing it by myself. Mm-hmm. It, it was really great. And then once I saw how the magazine was doing and I had gotten laid off, I was like, wait a minute, I could take this time and build a magazine up. But at that time, like my mom didn't consider me with her decision. I didn't consider my son either. Mm -hmm. And so as I'm sacrificing, he's going through the sacrifices as a kid as well. So take it from him having the Christmas of his dream and living in a great neighborhood and, you know, living life great to now we're sacrificing. We're going from state to state. Sometimes I'm living here. We have to live with somebody till I get the money up to, mm. to move into my own place. And then he's sleeping on somebody's couch. For me, that's how I grew up. You know, when my mom had a hardship, we went and lived with our grandmother or one of her friends. And we did it till she got on her feet. But my son didn't know that life. Mm. You know, I just yes. pushed him into that. Mm. 
And so when he turned 15, he came to me in the kitchen out of the blue. I'm in there, you know, at this point in time, we were straight, you know, that's the magazine started to, you know, elevate my branding business was great. You know, everything was running smoothly. And he came to me and said, you know what, mom, um, I forgive you. I looked at him and I was like, what? what? You forgive me for what? You yeah. Know? What, for feeding and clothing you? Because me, I'm thinking everything is wonderful. Yeah. And he said, no, I understand the sacrifices now. Hmm. And I'm, he just blew me away. He said, I understand the sacrifices now. I understand what you meant. Because the one uh, advice that my mother had given me a long time ago with my son was always, y'all are close. Stop screaming and hollering at him because that's what you learned from me. And sit down and communicate with him because that's what you guys do. So y'all are good friends. Talk. And I used to always tell him it's not going to be like this all the time. These sacrifices are helping us to get here, to get there. And so... He came when he came to me and said that my mom's voice, yo, came to me just as clear as day. And it I heard her say, I did what I thought was best. Yeah. When, yo, it was like full circle. And when I heard her say that and him talking to me, the the forgiveness and everything for my mother came at that moment. Hmm. Because I understood what she meant. Because when she said it to me, I didn't understand. Yeah. And I was like, you thought this man being my father was going to be the best thing for me. And he didn't take care of me. Okay. You yeah. know, I didn't understand. Yeah. But as a mother now, hmm. and my child is coming to me to say he forgives me. And I'm looking at him and he explains why he forgives me Mm -hmm. because he didn't grow up with all of those things like those ills that I did. I grew up from a child with this stuff up until teenage years, like sleeping on people's couches, my mom getting herself together, trying to, you know, figure this thing called life out with six children, you know? So even though me, I grew up like that, he didn't, he didn't understand the sacrifice until he was 15. Mm. And at that moment is when I just let it go with my mom and understood that she made the best decision for her. Just like I made the best decision about building this business for me that actually benefited my son. Yes, that's true. But it wasn't what was right for him necessarily. That's true. Yeah. And you're able to <laughs> you're able to break that um that chain by communicating with him and he also forgiving you and Isn't you forgiving that your mom. Yeah, that's Isn't his, that something? That's I his. just, you know, because I it wasn't like I was still in my 20s. No, I was in my late 30s when this mm. happened. I was like 36. Wow. And he came to me and he, not 36. I was like almost 40. And um, he came to me. And when he said that, it just, you know, clicked to me like, OK, <laughs> you <laughs> thought you was this mom, this, you know, thing. And so you understand your mom. You know, you understand the dynamics of this thing called parenthood that we're learning each day as we go. And Mm -hmm. we think we're doing this great job and which we are, you know, in certain ways, but in other ways, we fall through the cracks with our children. And the way to um, fill those holes is to accept the responsibility Mm -hmm. that you made these decisions for you and not necessarily for me. That's true. And, that, mm-hmm. that's, and so that's why a chapter of your book is titled, you know, uh, you, in, in a chapter of your book, you talked about forgiveness as the key to opening many doors. Like, I really understand that right now. Like, you know, um, your son coming over to you to tell you, Mama, I forgive you. And you also mm-hmm. having that, you know, reflection that, yeah, my mom did what she did for her own good, for her own best at the moment. And now you know better and you're doing better. And yeah, you're able to. Exactly. Complete. And without shame or blame. Mm. without and that's what I told my son I said now you're able the things and and I admire my son and I tell him this all the time that I admire him is because he had the 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 opportunity to come to me and talk to me about it 
Yes. And instead of me, like my mom gets really defensive if we come and we talk to her. She used to, because now we're able to talk, you know, and she's older and she comes with a level of understanding. Mm. But before she would get defensive and be ready to curse you out. And my mom is no joke. OK, mm. and so <laughs> I didn't have that um, opportunity until I was like now we're talking about it, you know, yes. but he has the opportunity to come to me and we talk in love and I'm able to say, no, nah, I don't think so. And he's able to, you know, just break it down and we speak to each other like that. And that is from accepting the things I cannot change and understand that I wasn't a perfect mom. I'm not a perfect person. So be able to be open to this criticism that he's telling you so that we can go on and, and, and he can be a whole human being, yes. you know, he yes. can be whole and with understanding and love. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And I, I love that. I mean, we have to forgive and we have to do that without shame, without judgment and grow from that. Accept it and grow. Yeah. And grow. Yes, I love that. <laughs> uh, th th thanks so much for opening my eyes in this episode. I really enjoyed this conversation. But I, I would love to know, you know, fr from your personal story, um, can you teach us or can you tell us how we could shut out, you know, outside influences and provide a blueprint of how we could move forward with our lives? Yes, yes. You have to be able to shut it down. Like even like this machine of social media, you mm -hmm. have to shut it down because each day you are receiving opinions yeah. from people and downloading of influences and images every day. Mm -hmm. And so we have to separate from ourselves from that whole machine and get with us and the God body within us, right? Yes. And pray and, and just ask for understanding mm. and knowledge, you know? And through that, you'll be directed on a path of understanding, of forgiveness and all of those things because you're being influenced by your God body and not from anything else that is trying to influence you in the world. And so that is the only way I've been able to move forward and do the things I've been able to do these past, you know, 16, 17 years, building a magazine and building myself up as a, you know, a grown person, a grown woman. Yes. But, you know, I don't went in your life when you were in welfare and when, you know, things don't seem as if you're going to progress in life. How were you able to like take hold of your purpose with confidence and also make the main thing the main thing? Like, you know, at some point in life when it seems like, yeah, there's no- This is what no, I'm supposed to do. Exactly. Yeah. I was, you know, at that point in time, I was into church like really heavy mm -hmm. until I went through this, that what they call church hurt, you know? And so- I had developed a newsletter there. I was so deep with it. Oh, when I got into church, I was so, so, so deep. <laughs> and I called it the Oracle. <laughs> and through the Oracle, I did the graphics. I wrote the articles and the people loved it. They loved my insight and everything. Mm -hmm. And so while I, was cre while I created that and I was leaving the church, I said, you know, it, I'm just sitting at work one day, like, if I'm going to leave the church, how would I be able to get the message out of positive news and, um, you know, all of the good things I wanted to talk about? Mm -hmm. And herein lies this amazing guy, Darren Morris, from my hometown. Every week he would put out a paper. It's called Cream Magazine. And in that newspaper... It held images of people from the neighborhood who graduated, who babies were turning like one, mm -hmm. um, who babies, um, who, I'm sorry, my phone, um, mm -hmm. whose babies are turning, you know, they're, they're celebrating graduation, mm -hmm. all of these things. And so I saw how every Friday when he put that magazine out, mm -hmm. that the people would run and want to see themselves, yeah. right? Yes. They, and I, I looked at that and I said, wow, mm. the power of representation is amazing. 
you could go ahead and put this newsletter out, but not as a newspaper. You don't want to do what he did. Mm. Do it as a magazine. Mm. And so from that moment, let me tell you something. One thing about me, if it comes from the inside, I know it's God. Yeah. And once I knew and in his it, it was just like a mat, not a newspaper like Darren's, but a magazine. Mm. And once I got it, I start researching. My mm. favorite magazines at the time were Ebony, which were the two biggest, yeah. Ebony Magazine and Essence. Yeah. And Ebony Magazine, John Johnson was the founder um, in, and editor-in-chief. And then Susan L. Taylor was the editor-in-chief of Essence. Essence. Mm-hmm. And so what I did was research their life. I read their books. Mm-hmm. I, I connected with these two because John, I, I, Mr. Johnson, Lord, I'm calling him John like I know him. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Johnson built it up in, in his book, talked about his childhood and how his childhood was similar. He lived um, with cousins and everything till his mom moved him to Chicago and they were poor and they lived at home and, you know, they lived with family when they moved away. And so, and, and then he built this machine of ebony. And then I connected with Susan L. Taylor because she was a single mom. She went to night school. She was making it happen. She knew that Essence was a gift and she was going to make that gift work for her. And so seeing these two people, these two amazing people who came from circumstances that were, you know, we hardships, you know, yeah. that gave me the vigor to know that I could do this. This could be done. I could do it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And so I just researched how a magazine, like the, the, the development of a magazine. And oh, I'm forgetting this great part. This is how you know your life is planned, right? Yeah. When I was 18, I was living on my own and I was in college mm-hmm. and I needed a job. And so I went in Trenton and found a job at a newspaper called Nubian News. And while they're working there, Mr. Kua Chakalia, he would teach me about font placements. He would teach me about a story and how um, pictures matching the stories. And so all of that, I acknowledged that I had. And then I had two people who were doing it, who were successful at it. I just knew I could do it. And I just learned the business. I did the research. I learned, you know, uh, um, how the the page sizes for a magazine and what kind of paper should it be printed out and all of those things. And I just moved forward with it and created Impact Magazine. Yeah, that's beautiful. I I love what you just said right now, like you... It, it came from within and you did the research right. you you taught you yeah you worked on it basically yeah right. you, didn't allow, you didn't allow the dream to die down because of right. circumstances but you you actually took the action yeah yeah and i was going through the process of life yeah. of my journey with all of these hardships yeah. building it because what i knew from the inside if god gave it to me it is going to see itself through mm. it is going to work i just knew it all mm. my i just knew it even before I even put one magazine out, I went to my family and I went to my friends and said, I know this thing is going to be big. I just know it. Mm-hmm. So either you're going to be with me now or, you know, I'm still going to this marriage go around is still going to be moving with yeah. you on it or not. Yes. Yeah. Because I just knew it. Yes. You, you only need God at your back, at your, at your side. Yeah. Also. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's yes. great. And, you know, in the book also, you shared about, you shared some points or some things that you know for sure. Like, yeah. um, can you share some of them with us? Like from your life journey so far, can you, share, can you tell us some things that you know for sure? Just like I was saying, what I know for sure is that if it is within you mm-hmm. and you bring it out, it's going. it has nothing to do but to prosper. You know, if God gave you this gift, I know for sure, if you are working in your God given gift and you get into that flow of life and that flow of life by listening and going through the things and listening to your own self, Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you know, yes, I know for sure that you're going to be well. You know, I know for sure that if you accept the things that you cannot change, it does not change the thing. It does not mean you're going to feel you're not you're going to stop feeling the way about the thing. Mm -hmm. It is going to allow you to move forward with your life without all that baggage on it. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. and those are some of the things that I know for sure. Wow. I know for sure forgiveness is the key and the gateway to moving forward in your life, you mm -hmm. know, because that helps get that baggage off. When you accept what you see, you accept the things you can't change and forgive. Yes, I love that. Forgiveness opens <laughs> doors for you and gets rid of the baggages that you don't need to move forward in life. Right. Yes. Right. And one other thing I love is that, you know, you began the journey of Impact Magazine, you know, after seeing the need in your community for positive imagery. That's so wonderful. Like seeing a need and providing a solution to it. It's, exactly. It's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us now a little bit about Impact Magazine and also about your other services, your life coaching services, your speaking engagement? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So just like you said, Impact Magazine is all about positive imagery mm -hmm. and to empower, encourage and educate black men and women. Yeah. That's what we do, you know. Yes. And um, that was just in seeing myself through John Johnson and Susan L. Taylor, I was able to know that I was able to create this good thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And so I understood that. And so now this is why what I've built Impact Magazine on to speak about the journey, because mm -hmm. that's I, I use myself as the the need, the person in need, yeah. because I all I knew was trauma. Yeah. So in order for me to be able to push forward in this positiveness, I had to see other people do it. Mm -hmm. And that's why representation matters. I had to see other people looking like me do the thing that I'm trying to do and push forward and do it and be successful yeah. with it, you know, and how do they deal with their home life mm -hmm. on the back end, mm -hmm. you know, cause we love to get connected to stuff that shine, but how do they deal with life on the back end? The things that you can't see mm -hmm. being a single mom, you know, Susan L. Teller, we connected. She was a single mom going to night school, doing all of these things. How did you keep your family together? Mm -hmm. You know? And the one thing I took away from her is when her child, when her daughter was at school and then when she was at school, but when they had that time together, that was their time. Nothing mm -hmm. came before that. So what I did for myself, when my son was at school, I was at work. When he came home from school and we had that time from six o'clock to nine o'clock, that was our time. We ate dinner together. We talked, we watched movies together. Mm -hmm. We did things together. That was our time. And then after he went to bed, that's when I built the magazine. Wow. Those were the, you know, those yeah. were the things. And so throughout that building up the magazine, I've had Karen Civil on the cover, Candy just had Tabitha Brown, just did an event with Tabitha Brown and David Banner. You know, I've um, been able to enjoy this journey of building this business because I had the representation to show me in the beginning that I'm able to do it. You know, and then through this business and going through life, I've been able to become a life coach, you know, and when people come to me, they know this, we're not bringing baggage of shame and blame with us. We're going to hold ourselves accountable and accept the things that we cannot change. Mm -hmm. And then my company, Impact Brand Strategist, we also help with branding. And that came about because Every week, someone was calling me on the phone to help them with their brand, mm -hmm. either connect them with someone or um, did did this picture look right with that? And one day I was on the phone with the publicist named Angie Collins, and we would speak at least like two, three times a week at this time. And um, I had every time I was on the phone with her and we're talking business, somebody would be calling me out. She'll hold on while I'm answering them and I'll get back. And I said one day, I said, you know what? 
I need to start charging people for this workout. And she said, yeah, yeah, because you're interrupting your business call to go try to help them out. Yes. And I said, you know what? I am. And, you know, I've helped people with their brands. Um, I've, uh, some of their brands have been uh, with the Obama administration, BET, um, you know, uh, Claire from Fashion Bomb Daily, like a lot of people, you know, brands I've, I've helped. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so beautiful. You see, it's, it's so wonderful how your, your life, you know, has been so far, like becoming who you are today. And I find you as a person who is full of inspire, um, inspiration and motivation for Black women and also for men out there also, for yes. every race and color. Like for me, I am, I've, I'm, I've been inspired by your story already. Like I'm, 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 going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to leave this conversation to become a better person, to do better and also to work on my purpose and, you know, improve my life and yeah, become it. Awesome. Yes. So um, what's the best way to, to connect and work with you? Like for, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there or listeners out there who have more questions to ask you, ways to contact you, okay. or want to get hold of your book and read it now. So what's the best way to connect with you, work with you, and also get your book? The best way to connect with me first is to follow Impact Magazine. That's it, its name on Instagram and Facebook. Um, but also my information personal page is Moments with Tunisia mm-hmm. and T-U-N-I-S-H-A. Uh, to buy the book, you can go onto the website. It is theimpactmagazine.com, theimpactmagazine.com. And to work with me, just DM me on um, Instagram, or you can look in my bio and email me, um, and let's get to work. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful, Tunisia. I, I really don't want to end this conversation, but <laughs> I, I, just want to say, I, just, I just want to say thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing your story with me at this moment and also sharing your book with the world to read and also to learn from your life journey so far to improve Black women's life, Black men's life, all lives, basically. Thank you so much mm-hmm. for, for following your purpose in life and blocking out all outside influences and just pushing and taking actions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I truly appreciate you. And I can't wait for people to get the book and read, you know, mm-hmm. and be inspired and and uh, get those how to and applicable steps that they need in order to accept the things that they cannot change and move forward in life. Hey there, podcast enthusiasts. Are you ready to add a little sparkle to your day? If you're loving the insightful conversations and captivating stories on Mirror Talk Podcast, here's a friendly nudge to hit that subscribe button. By subscribing, you'll never miss out on the empowering messages and thought-provoking discussions we bring to your ears. But wait, there's more. We're all about spreading positivity and inspiration, and you can be a part of it too. How? by sharing the love with your friends and family. Share this episode with your loved ones, and let's create a ripple effect of empowerment and growth together. And hey, if you've been enjoying what you hear, why not take a moment to leave us a glowing five-star review? Your feedback fuels our passion to keep delivering content that resonates with you. So hit that subscribe button, share the love, and leave us a review. Let's keep the conversation going, and spread the mirror talk magic far and wide. Thanks for tuning in, and remember, your support means the world to us.